Hello everybody and uh, welcome to the live panel discussion of the Understanding Language MOOC. Uh, thank you all very much for all the interesting comments that you've been sending. Uh, we've enjoyed reading them and just to let you know that you've still got time to respond to our two polls, the one on Attitudes to Elf and the other one on the future of English. Um, before we go any further with the panel discussion, I'd like to introduce my co-panelists to you. Uh, and we have Ing Wong. Hello. And Will Baker. Hello. And they're now going to each tell you a little bit about their research in the field. So we'll start with Will. Okay, well, hello everybody. Uh, it's uh, good to be here and uh, talking about our areas of research. So, uh, obviously this week is on global Englishes and my particular area of interest is English as a lingua franca and intercultural communication. And I've been really interested in kind of the interfaces between the two fields of research and also I guess of most relevance to today's discussion, what the implications of that are for teaching practice. So I've looked at things like the relationship between culture and language through English as a lingua franca and I think this is a particularly important area because of course the use of English as a lingua franca separates it from its uh, or what some people see as its original cultural context. So often people discuss English in terms of the UK or the United States or Australia and they think English is somehow linked to those Anglophone countries, which of course it is if an English person or an Australian or an American is using it, but it is not linked to those countries if it's used as a lingua franca or it's not necessarily linked to those countries. So I'm really interested in what that means for our understanding of the relationship between language and culture. And I think that has some really important implications for teaching because that uh, brings up questions about what the cultural content of teaching should be. If we're teaching English, should we be teaching English with images of Anglophone countries such as the UK and the US? And that's certainly the prevalent approach that many textbooks take. And for me, I think that's highly problematic because most people using English don't use it related to those places. So I've certainly argued in my own research and the kind of projects I've undertaken that cult the cultural content of uh, English language teaching should be much more localized. And also where obviously it is globalized, it should take a much wider range of references, so not just the Anglophone countries. Um, and then lastly, more recently, I've been looking at intercultural communication and English as a lingua franca and what that means for student mobility in international universities. So again, here I'm very interested in the links between language and between culture and between learning and uses of language in international universities where again there isn't a clear link between a particular language, English, and a particular setting. So for example you have international uh, universities which have students and staff from many different countries and what does this mean for how we prepare students for learning in those kind of environments? Okay well I think that's all I'm going to say for the moment but uh, if you've got any questions about that I'll be happy to talk about it later. Okay so now over to Ian. Okay, hello everybody. Um, I'm in. I'm lecturing global English in University of Southampton. And I'm also um, a winner of the module Language Ideologies in a Globalizing World. My particular research interest is, um, um, is in Chinese speakers' language attitudes or their language ideologies in the context of globalization. I particularly look at Chinese speakers' um, uh, language attitudes in relation to language realities within the uh, context of China uh, in the wider context of globalization. So uh, my research perspective is based on English as a lingua franca research as opposed to uh, English as a foreign language um, based SLA research. So yeah, I would like to share with you my insights uh, obtained from my research on Chinese speakers uh, who's from China and also who's uh, working in intercultural settings outside China. Okay. Thanks, Ying, and thanks, Will. And of course, as always, I forgot to introduce myself, um, Jennifer Jenkins. Um, my research has uh, moved around quite a bit. I started by being interested in um, how people communicate across first languages and cultures when they're using English as their lingua franca and I was looking particularly at intelligibility 
and accommodation, the way people adjusted the way they speak so that they make themselves understood better. Um, and I focused at that time particularly on accent pronunciation because that seemed to me to be the most um, obvious um, thing that affected uh, intelligibility. Uh, after I, that became very controversial and as a result of all the responses to that I got very interested in issues of identity and language attitudes and so I moved on to look at that for a while, um, attitudes and identities in, within English as a lingua franca. And then um, I got very interested in higher education and how all this relates to higher education. So for the last few years I've been looking at English as a lingua franca in higher education and how people are responding to it, how universities in different countries are responding to it, um, what students think about it, what staff think about it, whether they're native or non-native speakers, whether they're in anglophone or non-anglophone settings. And as part of this, I'm directing a big project that where we have nine countries um, and a team in a university in each country looking at what happens in their own university. So Will Ng and I, with another colleague, Jill, are looking at Southampton University. But we have colleagues with teams in China, Japan, Malaysia, um, and various parts of Europe as well. And Finland particularly, where um, Professor Anna Maurinen is, is the co-partner in directing this project. Um, okay, I think that's enough of us then, so let's move on to some of the questions that you've actually asked us before today on the website. Um, and we'll start with a couple of questions on a topic that comes up every time we talk about this, which is about correctness. Um, so, Yu Ching Kao asks, I'm not. I'm still not so sure about how to distinguish a lingua franca feature from an error that needs to be corrected, as the line sometimes can blur to me. I'd like to know more about real specific examples that identify these two differences. So maybe my question will be when to correct, when to know it's lingua franca as a teacher. She said this is a very broad question, but I'd like to hear some specific examples and cases being addressed during the panel and how do we as teachers deal with them? Thank you. And then Laura, or Laura maybe, Castex, very similar question, where do we draw the line between encouraging communication and simply allowing mistakes with the excuse of not having authority to set a standard? So we're looking really at what do we call correct and what do we say is okay in terms of ELF communication. and. Um, as um, Yu Ching has asked, um, can we give any specific examples? So who would like to start? <laughs> Let's go to Will then. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm happy to go first. Um, well, I think this is, as, as Jenny said, this is a question that comes up a lot and is clearly an, an issue of concern to teachers about correctness. But uh, I think the answer from English as a language, lingua franca research is is uh, rarely a simple answer, so I'm not sure how happy it's going to make you as a teacher. But I think you have something that English as a lingua franca research has shown is that what's acceptable and what's considered correct is very contextually dependent. So if you're teaching learners that there's only one correct way to write or say something, that's highly problematic. Because we know from examples of actual communication, such as the kind of data collected in, the, uh, in various English as a lingua franca research projects, that what's acceptable is highly varied. So there isn't one particular correct form of English or one particular correct way of using language. Now I realize that's, a, that's quite a big change in the way that we think about language and the way that we think about teaching. But I think it's, it's something that needs to be recognized and I think teaching in various different ways needs to deal with that. And I should also add that it's not just English as a lingua franca researchers that have been arguing this for a while now. There's a, a growing body of researchers who are interested in both language use and language teaching that have argued that we need to move away from this kind of prescriptive view of language that there is only one correct model to a much more kind of pluralistic uh, view of language where we accept that variety and variation are a key part of language and we should be teaching that as much as we teach particular forms. So I'm sorry if that's not an easy or simple answer but that is I think probably the most uh, accurate answer we can give at the moment. Okay, Ian, do you want to add to that? 
Yes, I agree that, actually I agree with the uh, questioner's uh, dilemma. It's true. Um, um, many, actually I'm just uh, from, I just, I just taught uh, a session on uh, standard English uh, in relation to English as a lingua franca and actually, I mean, I, I also received a question from students and who said they are happy with the conceptualization of English as a lingua franca, but when it comes to, you know, the English language teaching practice, it's really a big problem. So actually the point that I'd like to make is that uh, uh, probably we need to say what is established perspective and what is emergent perspective. And for uh, those newly emergent perspective to be accepted uh, in the English language teaching practice, I think it takes time. And um, but but this doesn't mean that there is no need to challenge what is um, being done at the moment. Um, and actually, I I I, I think. Um, uh, how, how, to, how to answer this question. I mean, uh, there are lots of uh, studies uh, from English as a lingua franca perspective emphasize, which emphasize the, what's happening behind the forms of language use. Um, and um, the, uh, we need to shift our focus on uh, our focus from you know, uh, language forms to what's behind the language forms. So actually, I mean, uh, for language teachers, um, probably we can make students aware why they are making mis why they are making mistakes and what's behind mistakes. If uh, if we simply consider those mistakes as mistakes because of our reference to established norms, um, probably this. I mean, I, I agree. This is one approach. On the other hand, I think we need to make students aware of different interpretation of errors or mistakes. So um, there are research showing us that speakers of English as a lingua franca are actually approaching and uh, changing or adapting their way of using English in order to suit uh, their purposes of using English. So actually for teachers, whether we should correct the students or not, actually, um, uh, prob I mean, prob uh, perhaps a more reasonable way is to net students aware, okay, the errors are considered as errors because of the reference to native English norms. However, there are also different interpretations of errors. I mean, the, the choice is student, but they need to make informed choice. As English language teachers, I mean, uh, to address the dilemma at the moment is to let them know that there are different possibilities in interpreting students' um, uh, mistakes or errors. So actually, I mean, yeah, th th this is my uh, uh, view on, uh, on this uh, dilemma. Actually, I, I really think this is a dilemma. It is, yes. Thanks, Ing, and thanks, Will. Um, I notice you've both avoided very carefully giving any specific examples, so poor Yuqin Kao hasn't, hasn't had her question answered. And I think we could add to what you said, which I agree with entirely, of course, um, that if you look at the corpora that have been collected of ELF use, so the voice corpus, Vienna Oxford International Corpus of English, the Alpha corpus, English as a lingua franca in academic settings, they do show typically how people are using ELF and they do give you the types of things that people, they do demonstrate the types of things that people say. So um, very often you find that what would be an uncountable noun in native English, for example, um, is used in a countable way, informations in the plural, advices, feedbacks, staffs, and so on. Um, and that is for me, I would never ever comment on that if anybody did that because I don't think there would ever be a situation where it couldn't be understood. Um, and for me, intelligibility and communication, successful communication is, is the main criterion when you decide or when I decide. Um, but I agree, therefore, that with what 
um, my colleagues have said, that it's all about what works in the context itself. If people are understanding each other um, when they're communicating, then I don't understand why anyone would want to say that what they're doing is actually a mistake. Um, and also, when you think about what native English speakers do, I mean, as a native English speaker, I don't, I don't use the um, idealized forms that are taught as correct English in the sort of books that are used with EFL students. In fact, about a minute ago, if you were to watch this again, I used a progressive form. I used an ing form, which I think would be considered incorrect um, in a textbook of EFL. Um, and um, I didn't deliberately do it; it just happened. But we don't, we don't use the sort the so-called standard forms that are taught. Um, and things are changing quite rapidly anyway. Um, Will talked about the fact that it's it's all about context, what works in the context. Um, and there was a time when we did think there might be a way to describe ELF and then we could do what these, uh, what the two of you have asked, the two people who asked the questions and say these are correct ELF forms and these are incorrect but there is no such thing as an ELF form because it is so variable. Um, so it, it, it's not going to be possible to give you a, a very clear answer to that question. So as Will said, um, uh, you're not going to be terribly happy with, with the way we've answered it, but we've done our best. But let's just look at, um, um, related to that, there were um, questions about um, standards. And we had very interesting, um, on the website we had two exchanges, but each between two people. Um, in the first case, they um, disagreed with each other, and in the second case, they agreed. So I'll read out what they said, and then we can see what everybody thinks about the issue of standards. So Monica, uh, I think Leander, she doesn't like the verb own very much, the verb to own, and wouldn't use it in relation to language. She says, I know there are bodies such as the Académie Française um, who have a different view, that is, that they insist on certain correct forms of the language and that the French own the language and should dictate how it's used. But she says, I prefer freedom of speech in this matter. Um, Stephen Lander um, says he also has difficulty with the idea of ownership. Um, but um, it, it means deciding what's well formed or not in a language and when, when you start to look at it like that in terms of what is well formed it makes more sense um, because um, he says oh, on certain non-native peculiarities um, such as German speakers calling a mobile phone a handy not well formed or are they well formed in their context um, does any utterance by anyone anywhere who thinks they're speaking English count as well formed? Probably not, he said, um, but where do you draw the line? So it's a similar idea of drawing the line. Uh, and then he says, he goes on to say that um, there's the issue of status, that using um, native-like English would give you um, more status, and that also this is related to the issue of credibility and that cyber criminals can be spotted by their um, faulty use of English. And so serious business people uh, want to avoid being placed in that category. So how far should that be respected? Um, though I would add that, um, this is me speaking now, that spies often speak very, very native-like English so as not to be identified. So we have um, a, dif a difference of opinion about whether, whether um, the, the native speakers own the language in the sense of deciding what is what counts as well-formed language. Um, and then we have two other people who agree with the second view, um, Catherine Jackson who says that it would be a good idea to teach the building blocks of language, teach them basic structures um, um, to um, work within um, because you have to provide learners with what they're asking for and what they need. Well, I'm not sure we would agree that they're all asking for native-like English and they all need it. And Anthony Woodgate agrees with that and says there should be a basic structure as described um, 
and that in English as a lingua franca will provide a crude communication system. It cannot replace a standardized form of English. So I wonder what my colleagues think about um, what should be, what would we would call well formed and what we would think of in terms of standard language, standard English. Sorry, that was rather a lot of a lot of quotes from, from the website all in one go. Where, where, what's your position on what is standard and what is well formed when we think about ELF? Okay, um, shall I go first to this time? <laughs> so um, I just um, um, talk about this from an ideological perspective. I mean, the perspective of language ideologies. And actually, we talk about standard English. If we um, actually, I think this point can be linked to the standardization of English as um, process of language policy. So actually, I mean. Um, Standard English, uh, if we talk about standardization, this relates to um, national language policy. Um, this is the uh, starting point of standard English, and we know that in different countries there are different standard languages. But, but today we're talking about non-native English speakers' use of or, or learning of standard English. So actually there is no, I mean, uh, what's when we talk about language policy, there are uh, majority languages and minority languages, and there are, uh, you know, the conflicts uh, centered on the standardization of a certain uh, standardization of language. There are conflicts centered on um, uh, different language uh, uh, centered on language um, uh, choice. And today we talk about non-native English speakers' English. For what reason? I mean, um, the question is why non-native English speakers are still, um, you know, uh, using standard English as their reference. Today, um, if we consider the global community, I mean, the, the, the world system, why, why non-native English speakers are conforming to native speakers' English? And uh, we probably, um, the what what applies to the standardization of English within the local community, local anglophone community, might not be uh, easily uh, applicable to standard English or English varieties or Englishes uh, in the global system, in the world system. And actually, um, I mean, I because I'm. Uh, focused on my research, focused on Chinese speakers' uh, language ideologies, and for them, many many people do not see the need to conform to native English speakers' English. Uh, it really depends on their purposes of using English, and for many people, they uh, they still have standard English uh, as reference uh, in their mind, but 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 they treat it as a default um, norm which they have to conform to, but in their language practice, in their everyday use of English, I mean those professionals who's, uh, who's actually using in, who, who actually use English for, for their uh, business life or for, for their professional life, they do not see the need to conform to standard English. And actually today, the majority of English users are non-native English speakers. So actually, who are norm setters? So if we talk about norm, what is the norm? Um, is this norm power related? It's, it's true that uh, if we talk about um, the world system, English is the majority language, is the most powerful language, but actually non-native English speakers are the majority of English users, so actually their Englishes should be the norm. When I say norm, I mean norm in statistic terms instead of norm in political terms. So actually here, I mean, there are lots of issues um, centered on the uh, conformity to standard English, particularly among non-native English speakers. So actually, the, the, the question is, who can own English? I know probably for native English speakers, this is very difficult to accept that, okay, um, non-native English speakers are claiming their ownership of English. Um, 
probably this is difficult, but just to look at the social linguistic reality, social linguistic um, uh, phenomenon, we can say that uh, you know sometimes it's is you know uh, if we adopt a descriptive perspective, non-native English speakers are actually you know using languages, uh, using English even if you um, if, even if you do not agree with their ownership of English, they are using English in their way. They are using English to suit their own purposes. So actually, probably this relates to the issue of legitimation, whether you can accept or not. But on the other hand, um, I, I happen to have published a paper uh, which shows that actually some people is arguing, OK, who cares? Yeah, who cares? Even if, you know, I'm sorry for this, uh, Jenny and Will, because uh, my, um, they are both my uh, colleagues who are actually British. And, and, and actually, yeah, it, it's true if, if we're talking about native English speakers, ownership of English, but non-native English speakers are still, you know, challenging the, uh, the rule, and they're still using English in their way. And they, if today, I mean, most, um, I mean, the biggest number of users of English are using English in their way. I I, I really doubt how much difference um, can be can be made if um, native English speakers is claiming uh, the ownership of English. So um, yeah, this is my uh, point of view. So do you think it's worth still teaching native English and letting people? Um, use it as they want, or would you not um, want native English to be the the, the um, um, question that the comment that talked about the building blocks of the language, the same basic structure? Would you say that that's not necessary, or it is necessary? Question to me. <laughs> yeah, to you. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I uh, I think um, a question needs to be answered. It needs to be asked is. Building blocks of what? Building blocks of which English? Okay, so in, in China, what would you teach in a classroom where they're learning English? What would you actually teach? What kind of English would you teach? Uh, okay, I, I, yeah. Actually, <laughs> this is... Um, so, in practical terms, we still need to have some materials for English teachers to, 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 uh, to use. And at the moment, the majority of English teaching materials are based on native English speaking norms. So this is the situation. So an easy way is to adapt their, um, their, 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 their teaching materials, is to adapt native English speaker, uh, native English speaking based materials. But, but it's important to let students know these are not um, the only version of English. And it's important to let students aware that uh, um, there are you know, different ways of using English. And fortunately, we also have um, a few corpus studies which gave us some uh, elf users language use in real life. So actually, they can be used by English teachers in China for their uh, uh, classroom uh, teaching. And at the same time, I have to mention the ACE English as a Lingua Franca conference, which was held in August in China. That's just last year, 2015. And the debate has already motivated the consideration of teaching materials suiting Chinese speakers and Chinese learners. So actually, um, in, in, in after that conference, I mean, uh, during, during the conference, um, some um, uh, key figures in English language teaching in China, for example, Professor, um, I don't know whether I can name them, uh, to not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I mean, a few key figures in ELT um, in China actually were proposing that we need to consider 
different cultures and we need to consider different uh, Englishes in our teaching materials. And I, um, I, I knew that uh, the foreign language teaching and press um, company uh, is already started to I mean, uh, bring in some English as a lingua franca thoughts in their uh, uh, textbook writing. And uh, so actually there are changes in English language teaching practice or at least there are some uh, trends uh, to show that people are starting to take, in, uh, to take English as a lingua franca ideas. At least the people are thinking that, okay, probably English as a foreign language perspectives needs to be reconsidered. So actually, we, we, see, we see changes, we see the trends, and uh, um, this is encouraging, I mean. Yeah, I mean, we can see it. it. It's good if it's happening in China, because China has the largest number of English users in any country in the world. Yeah. So if it's happening in China, that's, that's very, very positive. If, if you like that development, that's very positive. Uh, Will, do you want to add anything to this, or do you want to, us to move on? Um, well, what I was actually going to do is, uh, someone's just sent in a comment directly related to this, which I think is an interesting comment, which I'd like to address. Okay, great. So, uh, Edmund has sent in a comment that, from what uh, Ing was saying, and from what we've been saying, that ELF is, is fine for communication, but that it shouldn't replace the standard or become the standard. So, I mean, first of all, thank you for the, the comment, Edmund. And what I'd like to say to that is, as we've been trying to argue is really so far, and to emphasize the point that ELF is not a particular variety of English. So nobody's suggesting that there will be a kind of ELF that replaces another standard. I think as Ying was explaining, that the, the idea behind there being a standard is different ideologies. And what we see at the moment is that there are different competing ideologies of what counts as standard language forms or what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So I don't think any of us, but of course you can disagree with me if you don't, if you do think differently, but I don't think any of us would be arguing that there is a particular form of ELF that we would want codified, put into dictionaries, put into grammar books, and then it is taught as the standard. But I think what ELF research does show, and I think lo what lots of research, not just in ELF, but in social linguistics more generally, shows is that there are multiple standards, there isn't a single standard. So we're already in a situation where people do not agree on a standard, if they ever have, and I doubt whether people have ever agreed on a particular standard form of English. And what current research just highlights is how much variety there are, there is. And as English use spreads around the globe, as, as Ian was just saying, the, the huge number of people who use English as a second or an additional language or a third language or whatever, as the numbers of those increase, there are going to be multiple forms of English that are considered standard in one particular setting or for one particular use. So I think the question of what is going to be the standard is perhaps a little misguided. There isn't going to be one standard, there's going to be multiple standards. But nobody's proposing ELF as an alternative. What ELF shows is that is that degree of variety. Do you think there are actually going to be multiple standards, or do you think there will be no standards, just um, some sort of criterion that I was talking about earlier about um, successful communication as the standard? I mean, does there have to be any kind? Do there have to be any kind of standards at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with you. I, I guess I'm using the word standard because it was in Edmund's original question. But yeah, I mean, I, I find the word standard very problematic. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, thinking about a subject such as writing, there wouldn't necessarily be standards. But let's say you were writing for a particular business genre, then there would be what was acceptable in that genre. If you were writing a particular kind of academic paper, there would be what was acceptable in that particular kind of academic field. If you were at a particular kind of conference or meeting, again, there would be sets of, of norms that are considered acceptable there and things that would perhaps not be intelligible or acceptable. Yes, this leads to two other sort of branches of questions we've been having. Um, we've had questions coming in live and also were on the web beforehand about are there any tests of ELF? I mean, what we've just been talking about um, would make it extremely difficult to test English um, if we're saying there are no standards. What kind of thing would we actually then test? Uh, for example, instead of IELTS for getting into university, how would you how would you test? I mean, do you have views on that? Um, either um, Will or you? We start with Will as you're there. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I guess I'll just answer briefly, but I'd like to actually pass the question back to Jenny quite quickly because I think she's doing <laughs> some work on this at the moment. 
But uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, the first question was about IELTS in particular. I think IELTS is a good example of a, a test that tests something that's very narrow and very specific. And I would question how relevant it is for many of the people taking the test. IELTS, uh, first of all, claims to be based on native English, but it's certainly not my English. I don't write in the way that I see IELTS uh, essays written, so I'm not quite sure whose native English that is. Uh, but, I mean, putting that aside, I think it's very problematic to assume that people coming to universities need uh, one, or would be adequately tested through one particular kind of English. I mean, if you're coming to study uh, engineering, you need a very different set of uh, writing skills, a different set of vocabulary to if you're coming to study economics or if you're coming to study uh, textile design or something like that. So I think it's very problematic if we only do have one exam like that. Uh, so I guess, I mean, what we would need is a greater variety of exams and a, a more contextualized exams. Now, I realize there are economic and uh, administrative difficulties with such things, but I do think the current system is very unfair. And I also think it's very interesting that after decades and decades of using the IELTS exam and a large sums of money that are put into IELTS testing and research, they've yet to demonstrate any kind of clear link between people who do well at IELTS exams and then people who go on to do well in their particular degree course. Yeah, and also they haven't ever managed to demonstrate that the people that didn't do well enough in IELTS and didn't get their university place would have done badly at university. So they may have actually wrecked some careers um, for no good reason. They haven't been able to demonstrate that they were right to, um, to stop those people studying at university. And yes, it does, it does seem strange. I mean, when you think that most universities in the world are not in Anglophone countries, they're in non-Anglophone countries. Um, you know, we have just about 140 universities in this country. Um, there are more in the US, of course, um, but uh, I think less in Australia and New Zealand. But um, we are a minority in the world's universities. And most of those other universities have very large numbers of people. Their majorities are not native English speakers. So where they're teaching in English medium, um, the kind of English being used is very different from the kind in IELTS, even though I would say neither Will nor I speak the kind of English that or use the kind of English in IELTS. Um, but even when you look at an Anglophone country, I mean, for example, I was teaching a, a master's um, on course yesterday. We had 17 students in the room. 14 of them came from languages other than first languages other than English. Then there were three, one British English, one American English, and one I'm not quite sure where, where she came from. She didn't say, um, but she said she was a native English speaker. Um, so we had, a, you know, the communication that was going on was certainly not like the kind of communication that you would have in IELTS, in the IELTS exam. Which, where it's very heavily based on native English and where you get um, the interviewers, the speakers tend to be mostly some kind of native English speakers. Um, and they don't, I mean, when, I, when I've done research uh, into this, um, students, international students have always said, the vast majority of them have said that the kind of English that they were prepared for when they did their IELTS preparation course didn't prepare them even for study in a native English university like Southampton, where we are now. Um, that, um, you know, we have a lot of people here who come from other countries, other languages. The typical default use of English is as a lingua franca, not as a native language. Um, in fact, even even in my own case, I'm native English speaker, um, British, but most of the time I'm communicating in groups where um, English is the lingua franca among people from many different languages. And that's with my colleagues as well as with my students. So it, IELTS is very, very out of date. Um, not quite as bad as some of the others, but bad enough. Um, they're all very out of date. They call themselves international, but you know, they're not international. They, they are national exams. And it really is time that um, for the, the examination boards to rethink and invest all that money that, that, that they're, they're making from running these tests in, into designing more up-to-date and relevant and appropriate tests that actually are useful for the kind of study that people do these days in university or in the workplace. Um, 
Would I, anyone like to add? Ying, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you <clears throat> first. So um, I just want to add the point of the relevance of English being tested to English um, being actually used in real life situation. So I, I mean, actually, Jenny made this point very clear that many students who, or you know, uh, spend spending a lot of time um, in order to cope with English tests, but actually they are not actually using English here. Uh, in Southampton and I, uh, and other uh, international encounters. So actually English being tested and English being learned and taught within classrooms um, needs to be linked with English that is actually uh, used in real life situation. So um, this, um, I mean, yeah, we need to consider the subject matter of English uh, for English teaching and English testing. So, yeah, the point of relevance to real life use. Yeah, so, yeah, this is my point of view. Right, I think we've probably only got time to take one more set of questions. We've had questions on whether um, um, ELF um, is, is um, relevant for written English. We've also had the usual types of questions about who is better teacher, native or non-native English speaker. Um, which would you like to take? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, Will, it's gone to you. What would you okay. like to take? <laughs> I'll, I'll take the, the native, non-native one. I've, actually, I've just been writing yeah. and reading about that recently. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I think this is a really problematic distinction, and particularly for teaching. I mean, I don't deny, first of all, I don't deny for a second, there are obviously people who identify themselves as native speakers of languages, and I would identify myself as a native speaker of British English. And that's a very clear kind of uh, social linguistic identification and very normal. But the, the problem is, is when that becomes confused with uh, either a kind of standard or, and then in teaching, when it becomes confused with who is a good or a bad teacher. Now, I don't think good or bad teaching has anything to do with native. It has to do with uh, people's experience and qualifications as teaching. So I think it's uh, very clear that being a native speaker of English does not make you a good teacher of English. But I would also add being a non-native speaker of English doesn't make you a good teacher of English either. Being a good teacher of English is to do with your ability to teach the subject that you're trying to teach. So of course you need knowledge of the subject, you need knowledge of English, and you need knowledge of how you can teach that subject. So I think it's just an unhelpful distinction to talk about native and non-native speakers. We could talk about experienced and inexperienced teachers, we can talk about qualified and unqualified teachers, we can talk about uh, you know a, a range of categories that will affect the teaching in some way, but nativeness is very far down the list of things. And I think what's interesting is actually there seems to be uh, changing perceptions among, amongst teachers and I think administrators and the kind of people who hire teachers. So while in the past I think nativeness was certainly uh, considered a very uh, important category and still is to an extent. Uh, there is evidence that students are orientating more and more towards wanting teachers who have experience and who have proficiency whether they be native speakers or non-native speakers. And there's certainly uh, quite a lot of evidence in motivational research that students are motivated not by the idea of becoming native speakers of English but by the idea of joining a kind of international community of people who use English as a lingua franca, who use English globally. So in terms of teachers that means that the, the kind of teachers they want are teachers who have this kind of international orientation and experience as well, whether they be native or non-native speakers. Now what I would add to that is of course the majority of people around the world who teach English are likely to be non-native speakers. There are a lot more non-native speakers of English than there are native speakers. So I think you can expect that the majority of teachers and the majority of work on teacher training and teacher education in English will come from non-native speakers. However, I mean the reality at the moment is not that. The reality is that the majority of work on teacher education, on teaching approaches in English language teaching comes from Anglophone settings. And I do think that is very problematic and I think that needs to change as they are the, the, the minority. Okay, so I don't know if anyone else would like to add anything to that. Ian, would you like to um, say something about this? Yeah, so um, firstly I would like to say that the uh, native-non-native -native dichotomy might be um, 
irrelevant in today's globalizing world because of uh, migration. We know that so many people are actually um, bilingual or multilingual instead of monolingual. So, um, and 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 and. and and many um, parents are choosing to uh, raise bilingual child. So in this case, um, uh, when a child when, when a child is um, uh, is given bilingual education in family within family, so which language is his or her first language? So I mean, actually, this dichotomy um, is becoming more and more irrelevant uh, in today's uh, linguistic, I mean, social linguistic reality. So we, the first thing is to problematize this dichotomy. And secondly, I would like to say, actually, this dichotomy um, is putting non-native English speaking language teachers into a very, uh, into disadvantaged situation, which might need to be reconsidered uh, if we're talking about um, you know, uh, international community, and uh, I, I mean those points have been made uh, both by uh, Will just now, and also by uh, a lot of researchers in their uh, empirical works that uh, people have different views uh, regarding what makes a good language teacher or what makes a worse a language teacher, and they are not uh, native or non-native uh, defined. So um, actually, I, I, actually, I think this question um, needs to be reconsidered in order to empower non-native English-speaking uh, teachers. Um, just because um, the increasing number of non-native English speakers today, and it's not reasonable to expect native English speakers to provide all those uh, of so-called authentic um, language teaching is not reasonable. So, um, I mean, the, the, probably this is a political issue if we talk about power, if we talk about advantage and disadvantage. So this is not just a simply a linguistic issue. This can't be simply evaluated in linguistic terms. So. Um, yeah, this is my point of view, and uh, we have so many non-native English speaking um, uh, students who are doing uh, English uh, applied linguistics uh, uh, programs and courses here, and they are they are good teachers. I mean, there are lots of uh, examples from um, our lives and, and, and from our context. A lot of non-native English speaking teachers are good teachers. Yeah, I mean, we, I think that people are starting to recognise that, that change is happening and um, that we still have this situation where native English speakers fly into countries, particularly in East Asia um, and Southeast Asia, um, nets, jets, whatever they're called, um, and they have no teaching experience, they have no teaching qualification, they are simply um, given jobs because they're native English speakers and they're paid more highly than the local teachers who may have done four years of study to become a teacher um, and have qualifications and I think we still have this really disadvantaged situation where the status is given to the native speakers but and at the same time research has shown quite clearly that um, it helps the teaching process, the learning process if you're taught by somebody who knows your language so um, it's much more likely that um, the local native, non-native English speaking teacher will, will know the language of the learners, whereas the teacher who flies in from the UK or the US, uh, they may do, they may be bilingual, multilingual, but more likely they're not. So not only are they paid more and less qualified, but they are actually probably less effective at teaching. On the other hand, if they know the local language in the place they're going to, um, then there would be, I would imagine, not much difference, if any difference. Um, so we still have this situation, but I think we, I think we're all agreed that things might be improving or starting to improve. Um, I've had, a question has come in to me from Leo. 
um, and it must relate to something I said just earlier, which said, since you're all the time interacting with non-native speakers of English, has this affected your own kind of English? Has lingua franca changed you? I don't know whether my colleagues think my English has changed. I mean, ha have you noticed my English change or, or my English be a bit not, not so British all the time? Yeah, I like your English very much. And I <laughs> Uh, many international students also like your English, and they feel. I mean, I mean, you got, uh, I, I, I'm saying this because I also did my uh, PhD study here. So I, I, so I mean, I'm not promoting, I'm not promoting uh, Jennifer Jenkins uh, in this context. I mean, because I got uh, learning experience in this context, so I know um, international students like your English because it's. Um, is easy for us to understand, and most important thing is that you show the concern of um, you know intercultural um, communication and the the the, the needs of interna uh, international students' uh, needs for transparent language. So actually, I I'm not saying that your English is easier. I would like to say that your English is more transparent than uh, British locals. So yeah. yeah. Or even some of my other colleagues, <laughs> but um, I think to answer Leo's question, as I understand it, it would be that um, uh, partly what Ying has just said. I'm, I'm probably got I've become quite used to accommodating to people from different first languages. So I, I would tend, for example, not to use any. Um, British idiomatic language much of the time. I think that might be disappearing from my conversation with native English speakers as well because I get so used to not using idioms um, because I know they're not well understood except by people who grew up with those idioms. I've also found that I do use some um, I do use some um, items that would be features that would be found in corpora of elf where you know used by non-native English speakers I do say staffs quite often I've got out of the habit of saying a, a member of staff or three members of staff I might just say three staffs or a staff um, I often say discuss about uh, which is a very common feature that's found in elf corpora um, I think I've even said um, informations and things like that I think it has affected so I think the answer is yes but it's probably not very noticeable except that um, and I think this would be true of Will as well that um, the accommodation side of it I would say that Will uses transparent language idiom free language too I don't know what you think about that Will um, yes I would I would say I very much hope that my uh, communication in elf settings and internationally has changed the way I communicate and uh, I think it's crucial that it does because of course it, if I continue to speak in the way that, in a kind of idiomatic way, which is fine with people, as Jenny said, who you grow up with, who share the same idioms and things, but it's very hard to understand if you didn't grow up in that setting. So I would very much hope that my interaction in elf interactions has changed my English, but uh, only others can tell me whether that's true or not. I think we're running out of time. Have we got time for just one more? Okay, let's just take the writing because several people have asked about writing. Is there is there such a thing as written elf or can we talk about elf in terms of writing? These will have to be really short answers, like one minute each. Will, do you want to start? Okay, yeah. Um, well, again, I think obviously there isn't a kind of elf writing, just like there isn't a variety of elf that's spoken. So writing will be different for different genres and different places. Uh, and I think writing is obviously slower to change just because any kind of writing takes longer to change than uh, speak, spoken language does. But I think there is also signs that writing is changing. If you look particularly in academic publications, lots of journals now make it very clear that they will accept English, in, they will accept a variety of kinds of English, a variety of forms of English. And that in many cases they're much more interested in content than they are in actually the way it's written. Yeah, but I think there are still some issues there, but I'll keep it short. Okay, and in a minute on writing? Yeah, I, actually I think this has um, attracted a lot of, uh, uh, attracted elf researchers' attention, and we all know that Anna Marlon is actually doing research on academic English, and she collected a uh, corpus of uh, professional uh, researchers' uh, publications 
pre their publication. So th because I was involved in that research project as well, I helped her to collect um, uh, researchers' uh, papers uh, to to uh, in, in the, uh, I help her to collect uh, some Chinese writers, academic writers' papers. So those um, Chinese writers have their publication, but they sent us the um, the version is before proofreading. So their versions were accepted by the publishers, but the publishers asked them to do the final proofreading. So I mean. We, uh, elf researchers are looking at this aspect of language use in academic publication. So, I mean, this this is yeah. I mean, th this is a good 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 uh, good trend. Um, yeah, showing us that things might be changing in the future. And there are, and I also remember. I mean, uh, the uh, Journal of English as a Lingua Franca, and also um, the Journal of uh, development in uh, English as a lingua franca, no, not a journal, that's, that's the book series um, edited by Jenny and the Will. And um, those publications do not require contributors to write in uh, native speakers' English. They, they made it explicit um, uh, in the instruction to also say that uh, as long as your English is intelligible for international. Um, academia in, in, for international readers, your English should be okay. So actually, yeah, there are some changes uh, in this field. So um, if anyone's interested, um, Anna Marinen, um on the, on in the University of Helsinki has. Uh, I don't know if the corpus itself is available, but certainly information about the corpus. It's the uh, written. English as a lingua franca in academic settings corpus, the RELFA corpus um, and also her spoken English corpus is there and um, as is the voice corpus in on the Vienna uh, website you can you can actually see and hear the voice corpus but I think we're going to have to stop there so um, I think this just there's just time now for me to thank everybody um, for taking part in the course um, to thank Will and Ing for taking part in the panel today um, and to tell you about our master's program in global Englishes um, which you might be interested in finding out more about on our website and maybe um, taking that master's course um, and also we have every year an ELF conference the ELF conference this year it's the ninth one ELF 9 is going to be at the end of June in Spain, in Lleida, which is very close to Barcelona. And next year, the 10th ELF um, conference is going to be in Helsinki just before the middle of June. Um, and they, but they, there's an ELF conference website, so if you're interested in joining us, so a lot of us will be there, people from Southampton and for, from all around the world will be there. So do join us at these conferences. Um, so okay, so I think we we'll just now say goodbye to you. So, would you like to say goodbye, Ian? Okay, bye bye, everyone. I hope you enjoy the discussion. Yeah, and I also hope to see you somewhere in our discussion of English as a lingua franca. Yeah, Will. Okay, yes. So thank you for joining us, everyone, and goodbye. And may I also hope to see you perhaps at Southampton one day. Thank you, and goodbye from me, and hope to see you soon.